All right, everybody, we should be live for our weekly show here on the Game Wisdom channel. As always, every week we discuss game industry and game design topics. And joining me as always is my co-host, indie game developer Shark. How are you doing? I'm doing as good as can be expected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which isn't the best, but <laughs> yeah. I'm good by. <laughs> yep, me too. It's, I have a, a presentation this week. And then getting back to writing my book. I'm actually, I think, almost halfway done with book number three. But I have been tuning out the fact that I have to source all the images for the book. And mm. that is a hell for anyone who writes. <laughs> and Books, I am anyway. Not... What was that? Books, anyway. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to have to... That's going to be at least a good week or so, I think, just in terms of having to source all those images. And, of course, they have to make sense with what's going on in the book. You know, I can't yep. just put images of myself with sunburn on for 20 pages. I mean, you could. You might You might sell more copies if you do it that way. It's a, I know. I could. It could be the de deterioration of your Sandy playing a roguelike. Just show myself <laughs> in different degrees of sunburn sunburnness. Yeah, there we go. There, done. There you go, I just solved all that. <laughs> but The solution to all our problems. Mm -hmm. But we have, of course, some news to get to. The Epic Games Store is running, I think they're like third summer event right now. Which is weird, right? Yeah, there's three summers in a year. Oh, uh, if global warming continues to happen, there may be more. <laughs> <laughs> just well, be good. I I have to hate to tell you this, but global warming is going to continue. Even yeah. if mankind just ceased to exist, I mean, yeah. global warming is natural, you know? But will it's, steam live on forever? That's the big question. I mean, as long as there's water and heat, yes. <laughs> and with global warming, you know, we're yeah. not going to have a problem with heat. There we go. Until we go into global cooling. Mm-mm. So I picked up Man Eater, which I've been playing on and off. I was just telling Shark about like it feels like there's a really great game there that Man Eater just doesn't, I guess, rise to that occasion. Yeah, I, I think I think it is you know it looks like a quite good game. Like I haven't played it. Mm-hmm. It it definitely has its issues, and I think that if they fix some of those issues you know, most of it seems with combat, the way targeting mm -hmm. and, I guess, balance works. But I, I think they, they have something really good on their hands kind of thing. Just, I can't remember how much you're asking for. Did you ever figure that out? I think it was like 35 or $40. I know it wasn't AAA pricing. Yeah. I just don't see paying for that price for it. Like, mm -hmm. I could see paying twenty dollars for it easily. Yeah, and that's why I got twenty five. You know, yeah. but thirty, I would say that's too much for that game. But you know, everybody has their own kind of price levy, and that's kind of mine because, like, I figured I'd play it. You know, mm -hmm. maybe halfway through. And then be done with it, you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I might play it all the way through, but you know, I would definitely would not come back to it after beating it. Yeah, and I don't see uh, the desire to one hundred percent it either. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't do that either. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't even beat it. I would probably just get high enough in there to have a really cool shark, and then that's about the point where I quit. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, there's still a few games on Epic that I'm debating. I saw the Star Wars Dark Souls game. They technically have, I guess, Disco Elysium for $19, but I still don't know that's too much for me to really get into that game. I guess it'd be worth $20. Yeah. I did pick up the uh, World War Z, the uh, Game of the Year DLC thing for $9, so now my whole copy is ready. I just wish more people would pick that one up. Yeah, that's something I wouldn't have paid $9 for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. 
Anything else happening game related wise? Uh, Carrion came out this week. We of course played Fall Guys, and yeah, there's probably a topic there about. I think we did. Didn't we do something about longevity or a continuous support game with post release support? I don't think so. I, I we did something that I know hit on that, mm -hmm. but I don't think we did a topic on that itself. Because right. that could be something worth talking about. Because I think. Fall Guys is just going to fall flat on its face if it doesn't have a very extensive uh, post-release plan. Or even, you know, a week one release plan. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Speaking about game releases, I know Undermine, I think, is due out next week. I have a uh, recorded podcast interview I did with two of the leads that's going to go up on the same week. So nice. looking forward to that one. And still need some more uh, indie game submissions. I have, I am just about out of them. D indie devs need to make more games, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We need more indie mm -hmm. games. There's only thirty of them coming out a day. Yeah, we need more. Make that sixty, and then we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's get to some news and see if anything's interesting happening right now. And as one of those like perfect moments of serendipity, about 20 minutes ago, uh, Twitter semi blew up with Joe Rogan calling video games a waste of time. It's like they just yeah. deliver these pieces right to us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like everybody knows that just playing video games is a complete waste of time. There, mm -hmm. there's, you know, you you, you couldn't couldn't find. A worse way to spend your time than to waste it on a video game. Like, like, like. There's no, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't listen to an amazing story and just be sucked into it and just be mm -hmm. drawn into the world in a video game. You can't, you can't be amazed by this fantasy aesthetic that just completely blows your mind and and you fall in love. You can't have these amazing mechanics that just really you know scratch your 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 back kind of thing for you you can't just have these unique experiences that that leave an impression on you for a literal lifetime you can't have anything that is just so good that you want to keep on going back to it for literally 2,000 plus hours. Mm -hmm. You can't can't do anything in those video games. Wait a minute, you can. You can do all those things in a video game. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not a waste of time. I changed my mind. <laughs> and of course, don't forget the uh, social impact and just being able to talk with people and meet people you would never see in person. Oh yeah, yeah. Multiplayer, mm -hmm. you know, and not just multiplayer games. I mean, you can still do this in single player games. Because there's so many communities out there around single player games. Mm -hmm. Like Final Fantasy has like I don't know how many thousands of communities out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's probably thousands of communities out there or hundreds of communities out there for Darkest Dungeons. There's probably hundreds of communities out there for Xenoblade and like all these other games. There's probably, you know, Right, many large communities out there for many of them. Yeah. And uh, even stuff like what we're seeing with creative modes and being able to do stuff creative creatively in these games is a very big point. And mods. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at... I'm, I'm doing a presentation on Mario Maker this week and talking about using that to teach level design. Streams. G you know, game streams, you know. What's you, a game you, stream? You, it's a thing where you 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 stream on the internet, right? Never and when you it. stream on the internet, you play games and you display that on the on the 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 the, the video thing, right? Mm -hmm. the, the video thing. It's a very complicated term, but it, it, the video thing. You you put it on the video thing, right? And then there's people that will come in and and they'll type out messages like this, and uh, you know you do they can, say get good a lot. They, they, you know, only the best ones do. Okay. Sounds like this could be an easy way to make millions of dollars, right? 
Yeah, like like there's there's plenty of people making millions of dollars and getting all those connections, and they're even called uh, uh, influenza. I mean, in 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 influ in influencer. That that's the word. They're called influencers, you know, and and they they can make all the money and make you know thousands of connections, and mm-hmm. you know, not be a waste of time. Huh? There we go. Well, we solved it there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Apparently, there is a massive leak from Nintendo earlier this week of a lot of their like early projects and design like, over the last 20, 25 years. And very interesting. There's people debating about how important this stuff is or whether it's good that it's out there. And that's a very interesting, I think, debate right there. Because on one hand... Like we've always said, it's always. I think it's more important for us to see, you know, more that goes on behind the scenes when it comes to making video games and being a, stu- a developer. But on the other hand, people are arguing that this is being found out through illicit means and may hurt getting more information going forward. I mean, like when it comes to AAA, you never know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they. They have their own methods, you know, yep. and Nintendo especially is weird <laughs> when oh, it comes yes. to their own methods. So, I mean, you never know what it's going to cause with Nintendo. You can't can't predict that. Not that you could predict it with EA, but you could definitely predict it better with EA than you could with Nintendo. Mm-hmm. And, you know, enemies are pretty open about it for the most part you know the the non-scummy ones anyway because mm-hmm. the the you know indies you know that aren't scummy and aren't trying to get over on you they're like let me tell you more about the development of my game <laughs> <laughs> i mean you've never encountered that kind of thing on a podcast have you oh never <laughs> 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 oh yes and Again, I think in people are arguing about this with calls of, you know, game preservation, things like that. And who knows where things are going to go along those lines. Hmm. Trying to see if there's anything else newsworthy. I guess anything that sticks out to you this week? Uh, just, uh, just that uh, one story you told me about that we've already talked about with Joe Rogan. Now let's see. Ubisoft is still in a disaster mode, I guess, trying to recover after all the uh, accusations and droppings out of their top execs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll probably be scattering for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's and see. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of company Ubisoft will be after that. Hopefully I one mean, that still publishes uh, Anno. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully one that is better than they are now, because they're not very good right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I, I'm afraid it's going to be a worse. Mm. Not because we got rid of these people, but because of the people that came in and replaced them. You know, it's one of those, you know, you, you get rid of a powerful person, you create a power vacuum, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And sometimes, a lot of times when you create a power vacuum, somebody even worse takes up that position. Yeah. Let's see. So it's like going from evil to super evil. <laughs> <laughs> Forward saying, Metacritic is limited user reviews only after 36 hours after the game releases. Oh, yeah. That seems very weird. I, I know why they're doing it, and I think they have good intentions behind it, but they 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 have really botched that one because, mm-hmm. you know, as I said, the good intentions paved, it, paved the way to hell. Mm-hmm. Basically, the reason why they're doing that is basically... At least in theory, there's two reasons why they could be doing it. Really, you know, one's scummy and one's one's legitimate. I, I'm guessing they're legitimate, but you know, they could also be going the scummy route. 
the 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 good reason and and mind you you know it's not good it's good in theory but it's not good in practice kind of thing the good reason would be is keep people that don't own the game from leaving reviews because there have been many games that have gotten reviews before the game has even came out kind of mm -hmm. thing or you know hidden it the second it comes out kind of thing and because they don't like the developer for some reason which a lot of times is for a good reason sometimes it's not but you know a lot of times it is but still they shouldn't be doing that through reviews mm -hmm. They should be doing that through other means unless they actually bought the game and think that about the actual game. You know, that doesn't, you know, when I say that, that means that if a, you know, a developer puts a scummy, you know, monetization model in a game, you, and you have the game, absolutely leave that bad review because they earned it. It's part of the game, you know. Now, if they did something on social media or whatever and you've never played the game the game could be great and you not know it and you haven't played it don't don't go live a bad review yeah. but that that that's a good reason the bad reason is they could possibly ju just be trying to hide bull crap from from you know you know known developers trying to push bull crap mm -hmm. it could go either way but I'm going to give them the benefit of doubt and say that they're going to have the, the, the purest of intentions, but still, the purest of intentions is not good, still, because that's just not a good thing to do. I mean, they should open up reviews the, you know, at least within an hour of the game releasing. Yeah. You know, like, like because by that point, people have had at least an hour to get their hands on it and, and figure things out. Like, they don't need to open it up the second it, you know, hits the, you know, comes available. Or maybe even an hour and a half, two hours, whatever, the Steam refund, you know, range. You know, just some kind of point, not far after release. You know, it doesn't need to be 36 hours. It also doesn't need to be before or right at the release time either. Yeah. No, six hours would probably be fine. Yeah, somewhere around there. All right, but of course, one thing they would have, one thing I would recommend them do, if they were to go with the six hours, is let people leave their reviews, but don't post them yet. Yeah. You know, delayed posting kind of thing, acute posting kind of thing, <laughs> and then of course, you know. Actually, what I would do is I would allow the queue posting before, you know, the second we put it up there so that instantly, you know, everybody that left a review before, like, I don't know, 20 minutes after the game came out, those are automatically wiped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That way, you know, it's like, or, or maybe not wiped, they kept them on and then they're marked for spam and then they don't count towards the score. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of I mean, thing. you need to have something in place because you know there are people who will just you know abuse any of these systems. Yeah. <laughs> but thirty six hours after the game releases, seems like that's that's long. not good. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's very bad because even if they are doing it with the best you know intentions, that's still very bad for the consumers. You know and. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what the reviews are all about. Yep. And like we're going to talk about for our major topic, it doesn't take 36 hours to figure out if a game is good or bad or not. Nope. Well, it does if you buy it on like hour 35 and a half. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Alright, let's get to some weird games, see what's coming out, and then we'll get to our major topic then, because I think this will be a very good one. Especially mm -hmm. with a lot of the developers we know that watch. So, let's see what we have. There we go. 
So this game called Card Cataclysm. Cataclysm? There we go. Looks kind of interesting. Procedurally generated collectible card game. So the problem, of course, they have rejected the, my key or my request for it. Uh oh. I find it odd when people, when like platformers and roguelikes, uh, reject uh, my request because I think because those two are just like the bread and butter of the of the games that I play. Yeah. Games featured on this channel. Mm-hmm. So this game, Monster Crown, sounds very similar to Monster Train, doesn't it? Yep. Except, it looks like it's copying some other game. Yeah, doesn't that look like Earthbound? <laughs> so this looks like an M-rated version of Pokemon. Mm. Did I just see Jaws in there? Maybe. Uh, not really. Jaws. Gills. There's an E in there. Mm -mm. <laughs> and I don't know what the creature looked, looked like. Mm. Don't really know about that one. Yeah, it definitely looks very Pokemon inspired with like earthbound like graphics kind of thing. <laughs> can can the game? I mean, you, you can you can can? Nah. All right, and this one, I don't think I can click on this. It just sounds like I'm asking for trouble. Yep. <laughs> Probably. By the way, I found out something recently. Hmm. That uh, YouTube tends to censor more based off the text on the screen oh, rather good. than what you say. Oh, good. So. Perfect. Oh, good. Russian Punk 2007. They're not trying to copy anything, right? Nope. God press you for Ageless. I will take a look at it on Wednesday. Let's see. More expansions of The Sims. Travel Traveler's Rest. Oh, this was the... This was one of the games we looked at during the Summer Festival. The uh, was Tavern. Was that a shop soon? Yeah. Alright. Well, I'll put in for it. Mez... Oh, we looked at Mez Muratu, I think, already. Rogue Randy. That is a very weird uh, thumbnail. It's a very black thumbnail. Okay. Mm, it looks a, like a pretty dark slash black game. Like the whole... Mm -hmm. Everything's black except for the circle in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. There's that grounded game. Which, again, I'm not a survival fan, so I don't think I'll put in for it, but it could be good for survival fans. Tail. Each sail, I blow a balloon. There we go. Yeah, we looked at that one already. Mm hmm. I think we probably gave it more uh, praise or more uh, press than anyone else. I don't know. PewDiePie might cover it. There we go. And then you'll instantly succeed. Yep. And he'll instantly blow up so many balloons that he dies. He'll die from balloon exhalation or something. <laughs> what the? I don't think English was the first language for this one. Wolf Ghoul is a single player FPS game in which we fight in the forest. Be careful, various puzzles can block you. Defeat the targets, follow the instructions. Various creatures in the forest are the protectors of the diamonds you want to steal. The diamonds awaken the creatures. You can only rely on your weapon in the forest. And remember, all you can do is war. Because war never changes. War, what is it good for? Mm-hmm. What the? VR time machine traveling in history, medieval castle, fort, and village life in 1071 to 1453 Euro. That is a name right there. What about Momo.exe VR? <laughs> oh my god. 
<laughs> mm. Does that mean you are Momo? I guess. Or they're trying to stalk you? I mean, Momo's wearing the VR helmet. Mm hmm. What is Pandora? Ooh. It's a, it's a full of boxes of loot. Oh my goodness, we've just figured it out. Every loot box you're opening, you're open Pandora's box. There we go. Ooh, pig mountain riding. <laughs> Look at that animation, too. That's high quality. This looks like very basic Unreal assets to me. Yeah, and very basic low effort or, you know, no experience you know, animations. <laughs> They were either low effort or they didn't know how to animate. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we looked at Liberated on, I think, the previous Summer Festival. Did you feel liberated after you played it? Mm hmm. Thousand Threads. Sprout. What's this? I was not expecting that from that thumbnail. Okay. Thank you, thumbnails. After placing high in the last Game Maker of Way with the theme Small World. Well, it's a game jam game turn full game. It's a snap it's snappy. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, M Raid and AO stuff coming out right now. <laughs> well, I mean people need to you know they they gotta have something to do with their uh mm -hmm. their time now that Corona's Yep. Taking a hold. Mm-hmm. The scam. It's, what the hell? Is the scam the game itself? Yeah, Could I think be. it is. Cursor to get scammed. Okay. P-War. Oh, my God. Ah, there's Bartlow's Dread Machine. Oh, that's... A Wait, that's coming out already? I thought you said Bart loves Dread Machine. <laughs> I was like, wait, a Simpsons game? <laughs> crypto Clickers. Ooh, it's a Crypto Idol game. Do you actually earn real crypto by clicking on stuff? Maybe. Or the game earns it while you're doing it. Dandy Ace is an over-the-top roguelike. Wait, it's a rogue... Wait, is it a roguelite or a roguelike? It's a roguelike. It's a roguelike. <laughs> Let's see. You know that 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 brings into question. You know, what if you made an idle game that was a a a, a Bitcoin miner or whatever? I think they haven't somebody tried that already. Like illegally. Probably. Hmm. But to do it legitly, you would have to tell people that it's like that. And you'd also have to make it not take up all their resources. Just, mm -hmm. you know, 5 10% or something. Mm. And not seeing any uh, solid winners this week. Let's see. What about Gerrymander Madness? <laughs> Are you going to rig it? Of course. I mean, that's what gerrymandering mm -hmm. is. Craftopia. And this is all coming out in the next five days, too. Yeah, and you were complaining about not having enough games. Mm -hmm. You won't go play down the list one of these games. Yes, go down the list and request all of them. Mm -hmm. How about Anime School, Anime School Girl Dance Club? You want to play that Absolutely. one? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, Draken will be all up in that. Mm -hmm. Next, super fast paced top down arena shooter. Ooh, that thumbnail's hurting my eyes. You all the lens flare. Yep. Hmm. Depending on how long they hold it, that might be good or bad. <laughs> if it's just on there for just an instant, one frame, probably not going to be bad. 
What about court events? Oh yeah, we did play that one. Wait, do I have a key? I think I already have a key for that. Yeah, the developer sent that to me. I sent him the video, he never got back to me. Dawn at my Maybe you don't have a key anymore because it's not showing that you own it. <laughs> what the heck is this? So, somebody's played Zombies Ain't My Neighbors. A historic game that's a perfect mix between RPG and Metroidvania. I don't see any platforming. Or any RPG. <laughs> okay. I see... Uh, mm. Like a scrolling shooter. <laughs> Is what I see. Okay, VR Dragon game. Legends of Solitaire. We need a VR Shark game. There you go. Wait, there, there we go. Zango Shark Adventure. Uh oh. Story of a monkey. Story you need of a monkey. Gameplay. No. <laughs> it's not supposed to be a story of a monkey. It's supposed to be a story of a shark. They got the name wrong. Mm -hmm. Or the gameplay wrong. I think they get the gameplay wrong because you know they need to be having a shark. Well, it's a unique gameplay. They need more unique gameplay with a shark. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh my! Labyrinth two, just a game. Hmm. Epic car battle. Damn endless orcs. Damn endless orcs. Can't guess what game that is emulating. Mm hmm. A lot of visual novel stuff coming out right now. Jigsaw Emma up there. there. <laughs> Alright, this will be the last page and we'll get to our main topic. Time. Time gap puppies? And by the, the main topic, you mean the only topic unless we get a backup. Mm -hmm. If we do go to a backup, we finish too early. And I don't think we're going to be finishing early. Nope. Uh, wait, Hellbound. Didn't we, wait, did we look at this one last week? Or all the gritty first-person shooters are starting to blur together. Uh, probably both. Mm -hmm. All right. I probably looked at it already, and it probably is blurring together. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to our main topic then. And that is the ever-popular topic of learning to accept criticism as a game developer. As we've talked about many times over, when you are in the game industry, especially as an indie dev, you're going to have people looking at your game. And it is very important to have those skills ready for when you show your game to people, especially when they're not your immediate friends and family. Well, I mean, you 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 could be wrong on that because you may not have anybody looking at your game. You know, that's kind yeah. of the way the market goes right now. Yeah. You know, nobody looks at your game, nobody buys it, nobody does anything, and you just put out put out all that effort for nothing. <laughs> mm hmm. But one could argue that is a worse case scenario than people giving you criticism. Yeah. You can, you know, take the game, put your heart and soul into it, and throw it in a black hole. Or you could take the game, make put your heart and soul into it, and then people could say potentially bad things about it. Mm-hmm. And the problem that we've seen for a lot of developers is that they don't know how to prepare for this. And this can end very disastrously in numerous ways. You could piss off all the people wanting to buy your game. You could end up with getting uh, hit pieces put out on you. You or, can get that without doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you could completely ruin any chance on improving your game if you destroy or ignore all criticism. Yeah, there's actually a really easy way to 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 practice for it and get you know you'll be able to do it well. And that way is play test your game with play testers. 
mm-hmm. that will give you feedback and criticism. And, and you'll have firsthand them telling you stuff that they don't like and stuff that they want you to change and stuff that they like and all this other stuff. And you'll gain that experience in a much smaller, you know, potentially smaller, you know. <laughs> I mean, you could always throw your whole game into a black hole, but, you know, outside of throwing your game in a black hole, it is a, you know, much smaller community kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And you want to get as many testers as you can get that actually give you feedback. And when I say give you feedback, anybody that says nothing or this is good or this is bad, that's not feedback. Mm-hmm. Yep. They they need to say, I really like the way you did such and such. I really hate the way you did such and such. You know, that is feedback. Just saying something was good or something was bad or nothing at all is all the same exact thing. It's all nothing. Yep. No feedback. Mm-hmm. And as you said, having that small pool to begin with is a good step forward, but every developer needs to prepare for when their game goes on the market. And as I said in that post, what was I like two, three, no, that video two, three weeks ago, every video game sucks. Your game sucks. Uh, anybody's watching game sucks and you're going to hear that times a million when your game goes into the market okay first thing how dare you sir Mm -hmm. I need to take off my rubber glove and Mm -hmm. (laughs) turn down the door here (laughs) (laughs) and the problem is that as we were saying in the first part that People can review a game and they will like or dislike it for any number of reasons. There are some reviews that say, this game lets me wear a green hat. Thumbs up. Another game, the title screen is blue. Thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some really, really bad reviews out there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, bad feedback, you know. But don't take bad feedback as anything negative. I mean, like, there's there's some really negative, really toxic, really, like, make your eyes bleed stuff out there. That is good feedback. Like, they can go on a insult rant about, you know, how your mama stinks and everything and, you know, you know, wish your puppy to die and all this other stuff. And then, and then right at the end, say that, there was the game had no volume control, you know, to it, and and then keep on ranting, and then and then all this other stuff, and mm-hmm. you can take all those, you know, you you need to basically copy that and paste that into your thing, and then take and delete all the you know insults and everything, and then get down to that one nugget, that one little nugget of mm-hmm. th- there was no volume control. And that's your good feedback right there. Yep. So that long tirade of a post is still good feedback, potentially. Yep. That particular one is because it tells you that your volume control is not, you don't have one. Which we've never also, seen it, a game have that, right? Yeah, we've never seen anything like that. And that tells you two things. Number one, you need to put a volume slider in there. Mm-hmm. Number two, your music is probably too loud or too quiet by default. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's two improvements you can do to your game right there. And, you know, what I would suggest is you do that and put it out in your next patch. And when you do, mm-hmm. you'll reply to that comment. And don't, don't be an a-hole about it because if you... If you say anything mean or bad, guess what? That's recorded on the internet. It doesn't matter that somebody provoked you. Mm. It doesn't matter what they said. Because no matter what they said, no Kotaku doesn't care what they're going to say. You know, none of these, you know, no YouTuber cares what Kotaku, what, what this other guy said. All they care about is what you said. Mm-hmm. And uh, it doesn't matter if your thing is nowhere near as bad as theirs. Say anything bad, and it's recorded on the internet forever. And uh, it won't matter for them because, you know, at least for now, unless they decide to make a game or something. Yeah. 
you know, or run into politics, although that probably won't matter. That'll probably be a bonus to them. But, you know, if 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 they, you know, if they ever make a game, that's going to come back to bite them. And if you say anything negative, that's going to come back to bite you, you know. So don't ever reply back in negative. You reply back, I'm sorry you felt that way. We've added a volume slider, and we've changed the default volume, and we've also done many other changes that I hope you will like. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll give our game another chance. And, you know, some of them will, you know, do nothing. Some of them will reply back and get even more toxic. Some of them will go back and play your game, and then they'll say... Okay, this is good now. Okay, and they'll go back and edit their review and change it from a thumbs down to a thumbs up and put a little edit down at the bottom. You know, I changed my review because, you know, he's fixed the problem that I, you know, had a problem with. Mm-hmm. You know, thank you. And, you know, and then, and then you know, edit that out and then reply to your comment and said, I changed my review. Mm-hmm. You know, but, again, it, most people aren't going to do that. Well, the the inexperienced people that don't listen to our podcasts are not going to do that. Mm-hmm. If any of you guys watching this do that, I got I got a lot of teeth here for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the problem when it comes to being a developer and when you're accepting these reviews, as we've said, is that there are people out there who view their games as art, strictly as art. They're not products. They are. You know, masterpieces that they have spent years hand, you know, painstakingly creating by their very hands and blood, sweat, and tears. And how dare you say that my game sucks or complain about the volume control? I mean, games are pretty much that, but, you know, that doesn't mean you can't be criticized. I mean, like, you know, you know, Rembrandt and 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 Picasso and all these people were very criticized. Like some of them were laughed out of existence, kind of thing, and they died, never getting any kind of good publicity. You know, mm-hmm. and they were, you know, they were just crapped upon, on top of crapped upon, and they they never got their, you know, they died before. Mm-hmm. They became like world renowned, famous kind of thing. I can't remember which artist. There was few artists that way, but there was yeah. definitely some artists like that back in the day. And you know, hopefully, you don't have to wait till after you die to get yep. feedback kind of thing. But you know, fact is, is they were criticized too. You know, and you don't. You know, your art is the same as their art. It was different, but it's it's still the same. It's still available for criticism. You know, mm-hmm. because not everybody's going to like exactly what you did, and you can't please everybody. And nope. if you dare try to please everybody, you pretty much please nobody. That doesn't say you can't please more people than you would normally please, mm-hmm. because I mean, you could make a Zach like Zachtronics like game. And you'll just please the people that Zachtronics pleases, or you can make a Zachtronics game with good onboarding and please the people that that mm-hmm. Zachtronics pleases, as well as people who were interested in the game but afraid to even touch it because mm-hmm. there was no good onboarding. Yeah, and you could you could replace Zachtronics with Paradox with XCOM. Uh, Final Fantasy, you can pick any major franchise, a Total War, you name it, and there's always room to try and do something differently. But Or better. Yeah. But the problem with that, of course, is that you're still having to compete in that space and having to understand what those games did right, what they did wrong. And mm-hmm. one of the big things about being able to accept reviews is that you are going to make mistakes. Whether you knew about it beforehand or you didn't even realize there was a problem, people are, gamers are really, really good at breaking down games. When I uh, spoke with, uh, not, what's his name? I don't know. Uh, the developer, uh, Tim Keenan, I think. The one who did, uh, oh, what was it, the game? Oh, no, I can't believe I forget it. Uh, Duskers, there we go. And 
one of the big things about Duskers was that the people who play tested his game were able to find issues and problems that he never would have caught on his own. Yep. And you you made a really good point there about uh, about being able to find points. You know, gamers being able to find points in in games because game developers find points in games too. Because it's like, hey, I really like this game. I want to make something like this, <laughs> but I didn't like this one part, so I'm going to change it. Kind of thing. Guess what? That's feedback. Mm-hmm. You you just criticize the game that you like, and you're going to make a version of. Yeah. And if you can dish it out, you have to be able to receive it. Number one. Mm-hmm. And again, the one main thing you never do as a developer refuse all feedback. And that's oh, yeah. kind that's... of our that's like the mission statement for today's cast, right there. That's the that's the only reason why you would refuse all feedback mm-hmm. and everything is if you want a lot of people to absolutely you know torment you on the internet mm-hmm. and 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 torment your company and and go out of business and uh, look like the biggest a hole on the internet while being you know tormented by hundreds if not thousands of people. And having to delete your Twitter and delete your Facebook and delete everything, you know, quit your company, quit, you know, quit everything, you know, go into a deep depression, you know, think about life and you know why it's not worth living and all this other stuff. That 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 that's the reason why you want to do this kind of thing. So only if you're on a masochism of that level yeah. should you ever and want that kind of torment, should you ever not accept feedback. Mm-hmm. If if you don't want that, you know, living hell, then you know you should definitely get good at feedback, receiving feedback. Mm-hmm. And again, I talked about that story with a, a developer who was complaining that nobody was playing their game on Facebook, and I looked at the store page and found so many red flags, and they never got back to me about it. Did so you, you point out the red flags? Yeah. So again, you can in one breath, on one hand, say, my game is art and nobody can criticize it. And on the other hand, say, why is it nobody buying my game? Yeah, you know, one of those questions answers the other one. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason why nobody's playing your game is because you're not listening and fixing the things that everybody's saying they have a problem with. It's like, uh, let me think of an analogy. Right. It's like you, you, you know, some you you make a nail gun and nobody's buying it <laughs> because reviews across the storefront say that when you pull the trigger and, and you're shooting forward, it shoots a nail down into your foot, and you get nail your foot nailed to the floor. <laughs> And people are not happy about it, and uh, they're they're leaving one star reviews, and they are not. Nobody else is buying it because nobody else wants that. And you if you that. aren't fixing that, if you're not fixing that, then nobody's going to play your game. Nobody's going to buy your nail gun. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to buy a nail gun that shoots, no matter how fancy it is. You know, like like the if the you know if the nails are made out of fourteen karat gold, and you know. There's diamonds encrusted everywhere. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to buy it or play it because it shoots a nail in your dang foot. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, again, when you put your game out there, you have to, you're putting your game out there to be criticized. And like we said earlier, people are going to hate your game no matter what. It doesn't matter if it is the best version of any Metroidvania is a first person Fortnite Minecraft Metroidvania space sim. (laughs) It doesn't matter if it is the best game ever made, people are going to dislike it. Like I said... It's all the games. Yeah, it's it's everything. You know, that game, everything, the game, it really is everything. It's everything, everything. (laughs) (laughs) 
And the people, like, one thing that just always, like, makes me just, like, shake my head is when people are, you know, up in arms about somebody saying they either really like a game or they really dislike a game. As we saw with the whole uh, Last of Us 2, Ghost of Tsushima, like, I see, like, YouTubers who are, like, I don't know, they're, like, pounding their hands, their fists into their chest in excitement because somebody didn't like one of the games or they liked the other one. And, again, this is just par for the course when it comes to being in the game industry. People are going to love your game. They're going to hate your game. And there is no such thing, as we said, as that perfect game that everybody loves. Yeah. Except for one. Hmm? Which Pong. one? Everybody loves Pong because it was the first <laughs> game, and without it, no, there would be no games. I'm sure somebody will complain about Pong. I'm, I'm sure there's a negative review out there. <laughs> yeah, but they don't mean it because if it didn't exist, then they wouldn't have a video game. <laughs> So they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem when we talk about this from a reviewer's standpoint is that what do you do when you get that negative review? I'm talking full on, this game is a, a POS, This the developer is just a stupid, lazy person, I hate this game, it was horrible to play, the uh, person should never or should quit making video games, you know, zero out of five stars. Yeah. So my first mentor taught me something on that. And what he taught me was, is when you have nothing but pure vile and there's no reasonable feedback, what you do is you take an image of somebody who looks, you know, retarded. I don't mean physically retarded. I mean like, or mentally retarded. I mean just, you know, retarded. You know, whatever, whatever your definition of something that looks just stupid to you, mm -hmm. pick that. You know, pick something that that looks stupid and hilarious that you can laugh at, kind of thing. Not to make fun of the thing, but rather you take it and you put it to this. You know, put it over this comment and everything, and picture that this is the person that said this. You know? mm -hmm. And then you can just add some side effects, no, 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 you know, to it, and laugh at it mm. because. It means nothing because there is no feedback in there and you don't need to get depressed over it you can have a good laugh off of it though because like you know that helps mm -hmm. it helps deal with your you know it's a coping method to deal with the the stress of having to look at that kind of thing now I'm not telling you to go out and make fun of people or you know Specifically, that mental ill people are are bad because I'm one of them. You know, what I'm saying is is that you should find a way to cope with it, and that is a good way to cope with it. Just pretend somebody, you know, you know, whoever, whatever kind of crazy image you can get off the internet, and don't even have to be a real person. It can be some kind of cartoon, some kind of retarded looking cartoon character. You know, it could be like one of the, it could be the two stupid dogs. You know, you grab the two stupid dogs, you take it and you put it on that comment, and then you take the the comment and you say, well, isn't that cute? But it's wrong! <laughs> <laughs> and you have a good laugh about it. You, whatever you can do, you know, just some kind of coping method. That's what you do. Don't reply to it. Just laugh it off and go on with your day. Hmm. I always turn to... I was talking to one of the developers at Clay. This was around the time they were working on Don't Starve. Mm -hmm. And he his advice was, if you ever see feedback, like the second you see it, do not respond. Whether it's good, bad, whatever, wait like 20, 30 minutes, clear your head, and then take a look at it. And... Again, one thing, as you said a few minutes ago, you don't respond negatively. You cannot do that as a developer. Because yeah. you know what's going to happen. Everyone's going to see your response. They're not going to see what that person wrote. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And and it is good to clear out your head, take, take a few minutes. Don't, you know, he did have a really good advice there. You do want to take 
if you're going to reply to it, you need to clear your head first. Mm -hmm. And maybe take more than 20 minutes. You know, there there's no set time, but I would take at least 20 minutes. And if it's just pure negative with no feedback at all, I would never reply because that is just inviting punishment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if there is legitimate feedback in there, you know, like if it is, if it does have that nugget of gold in that pile of crap, then yeah, you might want to reply to it. But, you know, I would probably try to address the person from before replying to it. You know, if their complaint was that there was no volume slider or whatever, put a volume slider, push an update, then reply, yeah. kind of thing. Or, you know, and just because somebody left something that, you know, like, like there's no multiplayer in this game, there should be multiplayer. Don't don't just put multiplayer in there. Don't you're you're not just trying to please all the crowds at the cost of your business mm -hmm. because that's what game dev is as a business. Yeah, you're you know you can address everything, but you know main thing you need to 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 kind of come at it is if you're going to reply, only reply to ones that have legitimate feedback in there whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. warranted feedback or not. Like, every game is not meant to play, have multiplayer in it. But, you know, if you're going to reply, you know, reply with, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, you know, and then make your point, you know, and don't, don't ever be aggressive or passive aggressive because if you are, it's going to come back on you. Yeah. Uh, you saw it kind of with the uh, Ooblets developer, too. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is a very important point about when we talk about feedback and such. That, like we've said, when you release a game, you are opening the floodgates. For some developers, you may receive, you know, 5, 10 reviews, unfortunately. Some developers, you may receive several thousand reviews. But... Like, there is no such thing as that perfect game, and you have to understand that as you're developing a title and when you're accepting criticism. Because one of the surefire ways to just sink your game dev career is to assume that all feedback is worthless, or if it's negative, it doesn't matter. Because or all feedback is good. Yeah. You know, both of those are wrong. Yeah. Because the only way you're going to improve as a game developer is you need to iterate. And when you shut off all feedback, you lose that ability to iterate on your games. Like mm -hmm. I've said, like when people say just make video games, that's the best way to become a game developer, I just hate that expression. Because if all you do is make the same game, a hundred versions of that game, then you've basically made zero progress. You are It's a hundred times zero. That's how far you've come. Well, the reason why that saying's out there, and it, it does have a good point, but people are, you know, misconstruing that point. The, the, the point of that is, is that's how you get into your first game. Mm -hmm. Just go out there and do it. Like, like, you don't know what you're doing. Go out there and do it and learn by doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're supposed to learn how to give feed, accept feedback during that, you know, yeah. and criticism and all this other stuff. And you're supposed to grow as a developer because that's the whole point of getting out there and doing it because like like, like we have schools and stuff on there but like schools do not fully teach you how to make a game. They probably don't even 10% teach you how to play a game. You make a game. They might, you know, teach you how to program a game. They might teach you how to do art styles or art theory. You know, they might teach you some you know, essentials of game design, you know, but there's none of them out there, as far as I know of, that teach everything about game development, because as far as I know of, there's nobody out there that knows everything about game development. I think if you took every game developer on the world right now, and you combined all of them, and got the combined knowledge between all of them, 
I think we don't even know 40% of all game dev between all of us. You know, yeah. more or less separate. Yeah, and don't so forget, every cool genre is different. Every game is different in that regard. There are, again, like as we've said, there are basic foundational stuff when it mm -hmm. comes to game design. But you can't say that you are... There's no such thing as the omni-developer. The one who is the best platformer, first-person shooter, space sim, survival game, open world, roguelike, roguelite, rougelite, and so on and so forth. You forgot the new line, roguelite. There we go. Isn't that just and a visual the, novel? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and to Minister's point, like, I don't know exactly what you mean there, like, because, like, if somebody has a point, if, if somebody says something that is not an insult or just praise, then there is legitimate uh, um, feedback in there. Now, if it's usable feedback, that's a completely different thing, you know, because, you know, they can be complaining that there's not a multiplayer in there and you, the game is not meant to have multiplayer. But that doesn't mean that that's not good that's not feedback it's just not good feedback and you do need to listen to that kind of thing but you don't necessarily need to act on it you know because you don't act on all feedback you act on the feedback that you feel is right for your game and you have to make that decision yourself as a game designer it, but anything that is not just praise or anger is feedback feedback that you should be listening to. Yeah. And uh, I conf I refer to when we had John Brieger on, who does playtesting and kind of research in that regard, that you have to be able to parse feedback. No, It's rare to find somebody who will tell you exactly what they found wrong. And uh, we used that analogy before that. It's like being a doctor. That mm -hmm. somebody comes in and says, my stomach hurts. That could mean anything. It's up to you to figure out what that means. Somebody could say, your game is dumb. And they could be referring to the fact that a boss fight is in bounds. They could be saying a part, a section in level 3 is too difficult. They could even be saying that, you know, the A button should be the B function and the B function should be the A function. You don't know that by that comment. And you have to be able to start looking at what people say. And again, another big point about this is that you have to be able to prioritize what people are saying. Because as we said earlier, the developer who tries to please everybody will often, will most often please nobody. If you just take everything everybody says and puts it into your game, it turns into that design by committee, and then your game, your whole game concept just gets, you know, thrown out the window. Yeah. I'm going to wall back on something I said earlier about you should never reply to somebody who's just, you know, says nothing but bad things. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to say that you might want to, to do that. Now, I would not do this to the most toxic of them, but somebody who's not toxic and just say that this game is dumb, like if, if it's something mild, you know, on the mild side of, you know, that kind of thing. I might reply to it, might be willing to reply to it and be like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. What what about the game made you feel that way? Yeah. And see if you can fish for some good feedback kind of thing. Yeah. Because here's the this is one of the most important points for this topic. That if if one person says something, chances are there are more people who feel that way. And they may mm -hmm. not write a review. They may never even go to your forums. They may just play your game, run to that issue, and then immediately uninstall and refund. And you will n never know, you know, how many people were turned off by your game because of it. Mm -hmm. And another, and again, like, this is where we also have to combat the uh, echo chamber effect. Because there are developers out there, and I've seen this, who will try and sick their fans on reviewers or on anyone who dares criticize their game. There's and, YouTubers that do that too. Yep, it goes both ways for sure. And 
you have to be really careful about that because it can backfire on you. Again, you can point out when something is wrong, and there there's always a diplomatic way to do it. But you need to be very careful about escalation because mm -hmm. once, you know, you say your thing, they say their thing, okay, that's it. Whoever kind of throws the next punch is going to be the one everybody's looking at. Well, actually, the one they're going to be looking at is a game developer, pretty much. Yeah. A develop game developers normally get the worst side of everything. Mm -hmm. Welcome to game development. Yeah. I did have somebody try and target one of my reviews for their game. They actually posted about and they wanted people to say, "What is this? What do you think about this guy saying this stuff about my game?" Oh yeah. Mm hmm. How'd that work out for them? I think like nobody really cared, and like everyone just like kind of like ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> this was when I was like down to I think it was when I was like at six hundred uh, subscribers, so I guess I wasn't big enough to be a target. Again, uh, I keep testing the wars with controversial topics just to see how famous I am, and so far it hasn't blown up at all. Yeah. Tomorrow's... One day we'll, we'll we'll be talking about something completely you know mundane, and then like it'll blow up in this big controversy. Mm -hmm. Game like... wisdom. Hates, uh, I don't know, uh, hates auto jump. No, hates, uh, auto, uh, what's that? Uh, endless runners. Endless runners. There we go. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm world. <laughs> oh, I do have a lot of fans worldwide. Again, I'm more known worldwide than I am locally, so there's always that. <laughs> Are you are you more are you more world more worldwide famous than you are in your house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Yeah. Same here. My and, family takes time on nobody who just goes upstairs and plays games. Yeah, mine too. I just sit around and play video games all day long. You know, well, you know, on the internet, you know, I wouldn't say we're super famous, but you know, we're we're, we're famous compared to most people on the internet. <laughs> and you know, and you know, you guys might be like, "Wow, look at them!" And then you look at us in real life, and we go down there, and our families just think we do nothing, and we're just mm -hmm. up there playing video games and just you know, good for nothing, just playing yeah. video games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to bring this back to the topic, that when you're trying to parse this kind of feedback again. You can, you're can. you never going to know as a developer just how much you're going to get. And unfortunately, that is a very big problem. In the perfect mm -hmm. world, you know, every indie developer could guarantee at least 50 playtesters. There are developers out there who would kill to have 50 playtesters look at their game. I'm one of them. Yeah. And unfortunately, and when we talk about feedback and playtesting, that's another topic in of itself. But the outcome of this, again, is being able to look at what people say about your game objectively. And I know we've had a discussion, I think, with Tomo and Jack about this. And that you have to be able to separate yourself from your game. And it's tough to do that. Again, nobody likes having something they work, you know, months or years on to be ripped apart by somebody who just spent three minutes of their life playing it. Yeah. I, I never had that issue, personally. Mm -hmm. But, like, I, I can see it. Like, like it's, a, it's the same thing that happens with fanboys. You know, if you're, if you're one of these people that don't, you know, that hate fanboys, but you don't accept criticism, you are the fanboy of game development, essentially. Yeah. Because not listening to feedback and just saying, "Oh, this thing is good because this thing is good," that's 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 fanboy thing. That's fanboy territory. That's that's what not accepting criticism is. Not accepting criticism makes you the fanboy of your own game because your game can do no wrong. Yeah, your game is perfect, and it can do no wrong. You are the you're you're your own fanboy, and you don't want to be your own fanboy. You don't want to be a fanboy at all. Mm -hmm. 
And again, like, you have to be... Po like, again, you are going to be positive about your game. There's no way you can get around that. But you have... And like we've said, and again, totally. we're going to keep harping on this point. People don't care about your life story with your game. They don't care that you spend 10 years of your life and, you know, $2 million, you took out multiple mortgages on your home, you're going to be thrown out if your game doesn't if your game doesn't sell. They don't care that you spend, you know, the last three weeks working, you know, 20 hours a day on your game. They Well, they may, if you're famous. Okay. But mo unless, okay, unless you're Hio Kojima or uh, <laughs> Sid Meier, then they may care. Yeah. But at the end of the day, all they see is the store page, and they see any... You know, they see what is on there. If they see a game that looks like an asset flip, they're going to call it an asset flip. If they mm -hmm. see a game that people that looks like it's horrible to control, or if they play it and it just looks like a mishmash of ideas and it doesn't work, that's what they're going to say. And yeah. one of the most surefire ways to sink your career, as we've said, is not fire to accept back. that and fire and back mm -hmm. and like like for us like we've played so many indie games that look like legitimately great ideas that are completely ruined by playability UI UX design and that right there is where feedback comes in because mm -hmm. you know how you get user experience testing you let the user experience your game Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that people will call your game an asset flip mm -hmm. when it doesn't even look like an asset flip. Yep. You know, people call my last game an asset flip. And the only part they didn't call an asset flip was the actual asset that I had in there, which is the title screen. That's the only part they didn't call an asset. But it was the only thing that was actually an asset. They called all of my stuff assets. Because my stuff didn't match well. Yeah. And if you make something if you make something and it doesn't match itself or anything else in there, then they're gonna call an asset flip because the fact is the main way people have learned to disseminate mm -hmm. between an asset flip and a non asset flip is these things look out of place because they're mismatched. Yeah. And and like we've said, like it's very easy for people to spot these issues, and it's up to you to kind of again parse them. Because like you said right there, like people can call something an asset flip when it's not, but they can still have a legitimate complaint about your game that the artist mismatch, maybe the yeah. UI doesn't work, and you have to be able to understand that when people point out issues with your game, there is still that nugget of wisdom there. It may be completely buried in all the vitriol and anger that's in that message, but again, somebody saying your game is horrible is just as worth, or gives you just as much value as somebody says this is the best game ever. Because mm -hmm. the other point is that you don't want to just be sitting there and only looking at the 20 reviews that say, I love this game, it's my favorite game of all time, and there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. Because here's the, again, here's the sad truth, is that there is something wrong with every video game. Like, uh, when we came with that idea of, you know, everyone has their own, you know, masochism level. That people have different tolerances to issues. For myself, I can play games that are... I can play games very masochistic, masochistically... That is not easy to say. <laughs> until I hit certain pain points. Again, if your UI and UX design are off, that just doves, that dovetails it for me. I don't care if the gameplay is great. If I'm having a horrible time controlling your game, I'm done. I am out. There are people, like we've said, like, there are a lot of fans of Parox Interactive with their games that they will put up with all the onboarding, the UI issues, the UX issues, 
And they are more than fine with that. But there are so many people who will take one look at a Parallax Interactive game, load it up and say, Nope! Uninstall and refund it within maybe five minutes. Yeah. I mean, UI doesn't affect me all that much. Neither mm -hmm. does art for the most part. But what does affect me is controls. Mm -hmm. Like, when when I have to use, you know, you know, all these weird buttons in my, you know, keyboard and, like, detach my pinky from my from my hand and put it, you know, six inches away to actually play the game, yeah, I ain't playing it. You know, that's what really got me in, uh, uh, what was that one game, the uh, platformer that was about metal? They had a second part that came out. Uh, that platformer about metal? Yeah. Was it Might that have been party game that we played? No. No, it was single player. Speedrunners from Hell? No, no, no. It was metal. And it had really good aesthetic with all the gore and everything. Mm. Um, Slade? Maybe? No. Oh, uh, Slain Back from Hell? Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. The controls just killed me on that, and I could not play it. Yeah. And I got used to it. But again, we all have our own tolerances towards these issues. And again, control bindings, that's another very basic issue. And that would be something that, again, people will leave reviews saying, your game is hard to control, this is uncomfortable to play. Or, you know, why the hell is shoot insert on my keyboard? What kind of idiot developer did that? Yeah. And those three comments that I just said all point to the same issue and the same solution. Just said differently. Or put control and put controller rebinding in there. Mm-hmm. And to a minister's point about show ideas, yeah, that's one thing that again any developers are really good at, at that level of transparency. And it does help to build goodwill and, you know, support among people. So that when you do have bad news or you do have to say, We can't do this, people know that you've been working your ass off to actually make this happen and it's just not gonna work. And Again, that's another important point about game development. I, it may, it could be its own topic, I don't know, but that idea that sometimes you have to cut an idea. No matter yeah. if you love it, no matter if your fans demand it, sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, that happened to me in my last game, the word of the day, Chromasia. Mm -hmm. People, you know, there was one piece of feedback through my testers that I could not address. We tried and tried to address it, and that was putting shadows in the game. Mm -hmm. because the only way to put shadows in the game, and mind you, we should have done it, was completely redo all the art. What we should have done was just completely redo the art. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, the art is the main reason why it fell. Not because it didn't have shadows, but, you know, like if we had mm -hmm. done the shadows, if we had put in all that work to completely replace every piece of art and redo every animation, then we would have hopefully addressed the art problem. Not saying that we should have taken that feedback, but, you know, mm -hmm. you know, but we should have replaced all the art, which would have just been a side effect of taking that. But, like, mm -hmm. putting shadows in was not within, you know, scope. Like, it was, you know, we needed yeah. to get the game out. We couldn't really wait. And if we waited, you know, I mean, we already had the death flag already cut waving. You know, we already knew that we had six months until we go under unless we get a decent amount of income in here. And we didn't get the decent amount of income. And we did go under. Not completely under, but we went under. And, you know, I had to remove the game from Steam, shut down the LLC. Of course, you know, the government wants more money, so they didn't do it. And uh, now I'm on the hook for even more money. And like we said, it, it is very tough to be a game developer. I mean, we've said that many times over. And when you are in that position where you're trying to accept feedback and why criticism is so important, is that you need to be able to understand what people think of your game. And 
whether you are getting it from two people, 200 people, 2,000 people, whatever, you have to be willing to look at it. You have to be able to keep an objective mind about your game. And like we've said, there is that line between, you know, how much you're willing to change your game versus, you know, trying to adhere to your core gameplay loop. And Yeah, you don't want to just change everything that you get feedback for because yeah. then you run into the, that other issue. And like I said, like one of the big examples of this is from Brigador. That when I spoke with, I think it was Hugh Monahan about it, that the very first version of that game only featured the tank light control scheme. His fans really liked it. He liked it. But people were complaining that it was hard control, that they wanted something that was more, uh, more modernized. Something that, again, it feels better in your hands to play. And he outright turned it down. And guess what happened? A lot of people didn't buy his game, and those who did uh, reviewed it negatively because of it. And they went back to the drawing board, and they redid it for Up Armored Edition. And guess what? Up Armored Edition sold a lot better than the first version of his game, because he eventually listened to user feedback. Mm-hmm. Who would have guessed? If you give people, you know... If you make make the game enjoyable for people, people will actually want to buy it and play it. Yeah. And this is another very big point. This one I think could be a little bit of a tangent, but needs to be said. The, the excuse that you're making a retro game or you're making a game inspired by something else doesn't hold water these days. If you make a game that is purposely cumbersome, but you're trying to emulate a game from 1994, guess what? It's the year 2020. People don't want to play a game that is worse than a game that they played in 1994. Uh Uh-oh, we got Josh using current year arguments. Uh Uh-oh. This will be dated (laughs) in about 20 minutes. Exactly. But like we said, the market is constantly changing and it's shifting. And... You cannot use an excuse that you're trying to emulate something from 20 years ago. And yeah. one of like my favorite things when I spoke with um, why always for his name Mark Leonard Mark Lambert, uh, the one who's working on uh, not Scold uh, the other one the other modern retro Mac uh, base RPG. What was the name of it? If anyone remembers it, let me know. Uh, maybe it will come to me in a few minutes. But one of the things that he said was he didn't want to just make a game that will be released in 1995. What he wanted to do was make a game that is in honor of that, but looks like somebody kept iterating and refining on that design. So that could be something somebody who didn't grow up playing those games can at least enjoy and appreciate. And again, yeah. that's user feedback and user interface or user experience. Well, what, what I've seen a lot of times is, you know, people who actually made the games in the past mm-hmm. actually wanting to make that game again, but wanting to make it the way they wanted to make it, mm-hmm. but were not able to make it because of the limitations. Because of the limitations, they had this screwed up thing. Because of the limitation, they had this mm-hmm. screwed up thing. And because of the limitation, they had this screwed up thing. Because of this limitation, we couldn't put more than five colors in the game, you know? Yeah. And, again, like, there are people out there who will defend retro games as being this golden age. And, you know, every game from 1988 to 1994 was perfect, and there was nothing wrong with them. But the thing is, a lot of classic games suck. And they suck, again, due to issues outside the developer's controls. Or control. well, you know what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. 20 years from now... The classic games aren't going to be those. They're going to be the ones that we have now. And yeah. people are going to be arguing that the games we have now are perfect, and we damn well know they aren't. Yeah, somebody's going to defend to the death of... Uh, what was that game? Uh, Road to Redemption, that horrible. And they're going to say it's the finest piece of art. Mm-hmm. And they're going to want to do a remake of it and change literally nothing and leave all the bad crap in there. Yep. I remember when I interviewed uh, Bill Garner, who worked at Irrational Games during Bioshock, 
And one of the things that I hated about Bioshock was the control scheme. It was very cumbersome to have to switch between your know, plasma mode and weapon mode. Why couldn't I just use both those elements, like in Clive Barker's The Undying? And when I told Bill that, you know what he said to me? Right. He said that he agreed with me. It was a horrible control scheme. And that they originally had it in mind to do something similar to Clive Barker's Undying. But uh, comments and criticism from higher up said they didn't want that system, so they had to change it at the last minute. And that's how it happened. So for the people who will defend a game like Bioshock to the death, know that there are issues in that game that even the people who worked on it agree that there's problems with it. And don't like it. Mm -hmm. And had it that way before they were forced to change it back. Yeah. And, and there will be people 20 years from now that will want to do a Fallout 76 game. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, will want to keep it, you know, as derpy as it is as original. <laughs> and, 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 you know, bad monetized as original and all this other stuff because that was a perfect game and, you know, they should never change anything on it. And also, what's the point of playing that game? You can just go play Fallout 76. Well, you might not be able to. The servers <laughs> might be down. But, you know, in most games, you could do that. Yeah. Not that you'd want to, but, you know. Mm -hmm. You and could. On, mo on pretty much every game that is not locked to a server. <laughs> and again, going back to the idea of the echo chamber effect, as a developer, you also need to cultivate a community that is willing to give you feedback. Because there are developers out there who, if somebody says anything wrong about their game, you know, the audience will attack that person, and they won't do anything about it. Yeah. I have specifically put a lot of work into my community that I have into making them extra critical. You know, mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, I'll pitch an idea to them, and they will not blink an eye to call me out on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then they'll stop and listen after that. And I'll tell them, you know, why I have it in there. I'll make my, you know, point on why I think it's a good idea. And they'll either, you know, be like, oh, okay, we can see that. Or no, 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 no. You got to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. We ain't having that. And I get rid of it, you know, or I take it back to the drawing board and redo it to the point where, you know, I think that maybe they might accept it, you know, but I, I, I purposely trained them to be extra critical and, you know, call me out at any point in any time over anything so that I can get the, the most value out of my feedback that I get as well as um, I get more meaningful feedback, more feedback in total, and I don't ever have an echo chamber. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the fans of Game Wisdom, like, they will tell me when I do something wrong or they will point out uh, issues and such. And it's important to take that because it's the only way you grow. That is, again, like the mantra for when we talk about the importance of accepting criticism. The only way you're going to be able to grow is you have to listen to what people say about you. Yeah, like those videos that you leave like 10 minutes of black green at the end or in the middle. Mm -hmm. Or like, I remember one that was absolutely hilarious where you, you took the same clip of you like saying like two words or something yeah, and just stuck. played over and over. Yeah. And over. <laughs> I think that was an improvement. Mm. You should do that more often. Again, I could just, for these things, just record myself just saying just like random things, put it over here, go take a walk, and just let a shark rant for an hour. And it'll just be me <laughs> going, uh-huh, yeah. And nobody will notice. Exactly. Like that, what they did in Speed, when they just edit the footage and just be on loop. Yeah. That's what I'll do for the stream. I'll just record myself playing a game and just like saying random things, and then I'll just go relax for the whole night. <laughs> yeah, you 
you you have to play a little bit of the game before you start the stream, so you you know which recording to put in there. The one whether it's not bad or ooh, you know, you, you got mm mm. 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 You it's know. A, it's okay. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> And you gotta have your you you gotta have your two different videos the one that's the one for the the bad games and the one for the good games. There we go. But I just say it's not bad. Both of them. It will save me. I'll cut down the work by half. <laughs> People might might figure that one out though. Mm -mm. <laughs> because they want to see you suffer. Yeah. So you gotta eat on the sufferable ones. You gotta have the. Mm. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> And the good ones, I go, hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to discuss. I guess, anything that we haven't touched on yet? Huh. Um. I'm trying to think. We've, we've talked about Steam reviews already. Mm -hmm. Um. We haven't talked much about testing, which is sort of a tangent, but it's it is directly related. Mm. Yeah, we could go into that. Yeah. And with testing, again, you are never going to be able to perfectly hire play testers. Some people, like again, like when I saw with John, the uh, John Breger, he like he would go down to like game clubs and things like that and get feedback, but. As a developer, you're never going to know exactly the pool of people who are going to look at your game. And like we said, people are going to say your game is perfect. People are going to say they hate your game. And you have to be able to parse what they mean by it. And it is important, again, to get as much feedback from people as you can. Even if it's something as, you know, uh, banal as, I didn't like the fact that my character skips as their walk cycle. Yeah. It's very hard to get testers and everything. And that's that's a challenge of its own kind mm -hmm. of thing. But what you need to do is is get as many testers as you can that will give you feedback and you know, preferably good feedback. And what I specifically went out and did was I had my genre. I was being in a tactical RPG, and I went out and tried to find as many people as I could, but I especially went out and found people, you know, some people that were, you know, very into tactical RPGs, some people who were lukewarm about it, and some people that hated them. Yep. And I had them all test the game. And each one of them gave me a valuable piece of feedback kind of thing. The, the, the the ones that loved it really like helped me really improve the the you know feel of the, all the system the combats and everything and the story the the ones that were lukewarm about it really helped you know kind of uh streamline things you know as in you know this is you know kind of like eh you know, kind of thing here. Maybe you should move it somewhere else. And the people that hated it, hate that kind of genre, were, were pointing out the pain points that were keeping them from playing, which a lot of those pain points were onboarding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had them pointing out onboarding things. You had the, the, the middle class, kind, the middle, you know, favor, you know, stream, you know, streamlining, and you had the the upper class adding more complexity and depth kind of thing and mm -hmm. by the time I was we were done all of them really enjoyed the game thoroughly and you know not everybody's going to like your game but if you can make somebody who doesn't like your genre mm -hmm. like your game then you know and people who like the genre like the game and people who are met on the genre like your game then you probably have a pretty solid game. You know, even if it's just a sample size of six, because that's all the testers I really had. And yeah. then after that, I brought in my final batch of testers, you know, which were people who I was hoping would be more critics, you know, not your mm -hmm. common people, but, you know, like 
YouTuber friends of mine, you know, game developer friends of mine, and, you know, had Tomo in there and, you know, several other people, you know, that I thought would be more critical and try to, you know, squeeze yeah. that much more out of it. And and I squeezed quite a lot. Enough for another, I think it's like 26 versions or so after that point. Mm -hmm. But they they all helped, you know, and having that variety really, really helps. If you only get people who are, at, you know, love tactical RPGs, already know how to play them, you're probably going to have very bad onboarding. You're probably going to have no no streamlining of the game. And you're probably going to have all of the complexity, even complexity for no reason. You know, hey, why should I level up this when I can just level up this? Well, we wanted the options, you know. Like, this is the false choice, you know. And if you put your points here, you just completely screw yourself. And if you put your points here you just become OP. So anybody who knows what they're doing will automatically go for the OP build. Yeah, the problem is, is you know, that's not a very big portion of your audience. That is the, you know, top 0.1% or something of your audience. And guess what? They're the only people who like your game now. Yep. You just cut your 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 game down by 1000%. Mm -hmm. uh, when we did the talk about frustrating games and tracking kind of like the amount of time people play your game, if you remember, I showed some of the achievements of games where, you know, 87% of the people loaded up the game, and then 20% of the people actually made it past the opening tutorial. And this is a, one of those issues that if you want to design a game that only you know, 1% of your fan base is going to enjoy it, you can do that. But then don't come crying when you don't have enough money to keep making video games. Mm -hmm. And and I want to make this point. You know, some of you guys look up to me and think that I'm, you know, an amazing game developer. And thank you for thinking that. But I am not immune to this. Like, I will do stuff that is completely stupid and, you know, and, you know there's no reason for and I'm counting on feedback to to filter that out so I can fix it. You know, I mean, that in the end is what testers are. They're filter, basically. You know, it's like, you know, if you don't do testing, it's like drinking unfiltered water. You, you, you're going to get syphilis or something. You're going to get something bad and die <laughs> if you drink enough of it. And you just never know how much is enough. It could be one sip. It could be, you know, 200 gallons. But at some point, it's not a question on if you'll get sick and die. It's a question on when you'll get sick and die. And that when is most likely when you release your game. Mm -hmm. Most likely. But you may get lucky. You may get lucky and not, not, not get it in the first game. It may take your second game, your third mm -hmm. game. Yeah. More than likely, you're not going to get that far. You know, more than likely, you're going to win the lotto before you go that far. Yep. More than likely, you're probably going to have to win the lotto to not get it in the first game. So, so. Mm -hmm. And again, this is why we see so many indie games that come out that people will say, oh, it's the greatest game ever. I love it. There's no problems with it. And then I see less than half the people actually may have passed, you know, level two. And, and there are people. And those people are the ones that were praising it. Exactly, there are people who will praise a game, and maybe only play twenty percent of it. And well, they'll, you know, they'll yeah. argue saying, you know, I saw all I needed to see. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't help improve this game and give credible feedback. Like I said, somebody argued with me about issues with Celeste, and I said, well, did you play the DLC? Like, no, I stopped playing after... I only played it for the story, and that was it. And yet, that doesn't help me when we're talking about onboarding and playability issues. Yep. And like we've said, there are... like When we talk about people who will only look at games as an art form, that there are plenty of critically praised games that have massive issues with their onboarding and playability... That again are just you know 
ignored because people praise it for, you know, the art. Or, you know, this song moved me and I cried 10 out of 10 game. Yeah. <laughs> and games are art, but... They're also art, products. Art, art, yeah. And and also art is is the thing that is most open to criticism. I think art is more open to criticism than products are. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Because art is more, uh, what's the term? Um, subjective? Yeah, that's the term. Art is more subjective. And, mm-hmm. you know, products are not. Like, you know, a fork is not subjective. You know, <laughs> as long as a fork works, they they don't really care. You know, art. You know, like, like unless you have one of those fancy forks that cost about three hundred thousand dollars to buy, nobody's gonna criticize you on how it looks. And if if you're selling a fork for three hundred thousand dollars, they probably aren't gonna buy it if it doesn't look good. So you just mm-hmm. didn't sell anything. You just went bankrupt, mm-hmm. just like a game developer. Yep. I think, like, you can use, like, to Minister's uh, point about using, like, Reddit and stuff like that, you can use, like, forums and stuff like that as a source of feedback, but, again, you have to be really careful, you know, not to just listen to one group of people. Like, uh, Shark said a few minutes ago about with gameplay tests for Chromasia, he looked at people who are hardcore fans of the genre, minor fans, and people who've never played a game before. And yes, it is important. If you're making a first-person shooter, then, yeah, you want to get feedback from people who play first-person shooters. That's an important point. But Mm -hmm. you also need to look at people who have never played those games. Those who... Those who can give you feedback about why they don't like those. Again, one of the reasons why companies like Nintendo and Blizzard have done so well is that they try to make their games as appealing as possible and make accommodations for people who aren't the best platformers or who don't play CCGs or real-time strategy games or whatever. And there are people who mock them for that, who, you know, say, oh, they're just, you know, trying to be a... They're just trying to, you know, score culture points or they're trying to, you know, cater to the non-fans. But, Mm -hmm. again, if you want to grow... You need as many people to enjoy your game as possible. When we saw kind of the downfall of titles like Evolve and a lot of those like multiplayer centric games that they only cater to the hardcore multiplayer audience. The problem is that hardcore multiplayer audience were already playing games like Call of Duty and Battlefield and so on and so forth. And they didn't want to switch. Nope. And I've, I've never used Reddit for that kind of thing. I don't know if that would be a best place for it. Because, like, Reddit scares me. <laughs> as does Twitter and Facebook. Mm-hmm. I like Discord. You know, specifically, you know, you know, game art discords and game development discords and any kind of, you know, game dev-focused you know, Discord in any fashion tends to give you really good feedback. And, you know, when I look for testers and everything, I don't do public testing. Mm-hmm. That That's that's a big no-no because of multiple reasons. Number one, you know, if you put the, if you put a public version of the game out there, you know, then mm-hmm. Google's going to get screenshots from it <laughs> and you know you have all this placeholder art it looks like crap three years later when you release the game and it looks amazing and somebody googles the name of your game and they look at the in the 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 top things that come up the first like 20 pages or so are all that really crappy looking placeholder art and people are oh, going to be like yes. uh, no no, mm-hmm. I am not touching this game with a 2,000-foot pole. But your game looks nothing like that because you 
put it out there. And Google will do that to you. Google, Google will absolutely, remembers. Google will absolutely sync your game. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They will give whatever came out first. And guess what came out first? The crappier looking version of your game. Mm -hmm. And again, and knowing when to publicize and release about your game, that's another topic in of itself, easily. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is the way to get testers is you do testing is not publicly. Mm -hmm. What you do is you, you look for people publicly. And then when you find those people, you take them privately onto your you know, private Discord channel or whatever, you know, your private Discord chat, your group chat, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you give them the key there, you know, and and have them play and test and give you feedback there in that private setting, not on the open World Wide Web, where Google and anybody that wants to cause trouble can see it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if a drama YouTuber, you know, finds your game and and they hate you for some reason. Or no reason. They just, but they still hate you, mm -hmm. and they want to, you know, come after you. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to look for the crappiest screenshots and everything they can do of your, of your game, and they are going to have a field day. So you should definitely not be publicly showing. You know, well, not publicly showing, but publicly putting out a version of your game that is inferior, mm -hmm. as well as you should not be marketing it. The only way you can possibly get away with that kind of thing is if you're a famous developer already. If you're Clay, you can put out you know, you know, prototype art that is just black and white, and you know shows uh, a. You know, black and white texture of hey, look at this crazy shape of a machine. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about it? You know, that works for them. You know, yeah. because they're, they're already famous. famous. Yeah, yeah, because everybody knows where that's going. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. Oh, I can I can picture this. I know what their other art looks like, and when this gets done, this is going to look really amazing. Mm -hmm. They already know that. So yeah. they're willing to accept it and go forward and, and, and treat it as really good. Your art that they've never seen a finished thing of, they're not going to picture what it's going to look like in the end, mm -hmm. like they can with Quake. They're going to picture what it looks like now. Yeah. And it looks like a train wreck now. They're like, well, this game is a train wreck. Yeah. Unsubscribe, you know, or whatever, you know? Yeah, and again, this is why so much about that the user experience really matters because people are going to look immediately at the very first things that you put out about your game or the first five to ten minutes of play and that is going to represent for them the entirety of your title. You can have, you know, like we said, the whole idea that the real game begins 20, 30, 40 hours in is not how you design a good game. Is what we see from a lot of developers who, again, focus on, you know, the minority of people who are trying to play their game. The people who are going to put up with all the issues, all the playability problems, the UX issues that are in your game, and they fall in love with it 30 hours in. But guess what? Most people aren't going to give your game 30 hours for it to become amazing. Well, I mean, are you sure they won't give it 30 hours of watching cutscenes and whatnot. And just Unless you're Hio Kojima. Mm. Again. I need to I need to be Hiro, Hiro Kojima. Yep. That's how you become successful as a game developer. Just be Hiro Kojima. There we go. Well, we, we just solved the uh, the world's problems right here. You know, I, I think we've we we've, we've 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 broken through game development and we just there's the ultimate solution. We're we're done here. Like like you know, I mean like I mean, what are you going to do now, Josh? I mean, like, there's yeah. no more content to make. You know, yeah, we did. We we sold all game design. Yep. <laughs> but I think with that, uh, I think we can probably start to wrap things up. We're approaching two hours right now, so I guess anything uh, final that you want to bring up? Huh. 
just sort of a recap, like like mm-hmm. we need to accept feedback. We need to deal with feedback, and you know we have to do it in a way that is mentally sound for us because mm-hmm. there are those bad ones and if you if you read those they're going to drag your mental condition down and they're going to put you in a depression if you let them and you have to avoid it and not let them put you in that mental depression and it's hard you know i know that you know you know many people several people call my game an asset flip you know uh, several people call it an RPG Maker game, and it's like um, <laughs> you know that RPG Maker makes RPGs, not tactical RPGs, right? I thought RPG Maker makes Call of Duty. Oh, it does. Mm-hmm. And and like in the end, I I now know what they why they said that. They they said that for for two reasons. And you know, both of them said it because the art mismatched. Mm-hmm. But you know, I there was no way to get that from their feedback kind of thing. There is no way to you know do get understand that besides hindsight twenty twenty. But there was other people that came a lot closer to that that I might could have got it from. But they definitely did not in any way remotely you know address it directly or you know, it was just hinted around at best in the best of them mm-hmm. and the and and people have criticized me on this on discord about you know giving feedback and it's like he didn't ask for that kind of feedback yeah I you know but he asked for feedback yeah. I'm going to give him feedback if he's asking for feedback. Yep. I'm not going to, he's not going to have to tell me, hey, you know, you know, what do you think about this one pixel right here? Is this one pixel good? I'm going to tell him, you know, hey, you know, your tile over there is completely mismatched, mm-hmm. you know, to this other tile, and this other tile is mismatched over here, and you really oversaturated your colors. Your problem is not that one pixel. Your problem mm-hmm. is everything else but that one pixel you and, know and and somebody else will say your thing is perfect don't change anything i mean uh I and they was, did they they did they literally said that right yeah. after that oh yeah like i stalk a few of the like facebook like indie dev groups i used to it since i like kind of got away from facebook and there are people who will post them that looks horrible and they'll go so what do you think and you know 10 people say i love it best thing ever can't wait to play this game and i'm just looking at it going this looks terrible. But of course, if you post that, people will say, oh, you're just hating on them, or, you know, how you're just attacking them. Yeah. That that specific instance I'm referring to was somebody posting a image of, like, a, like side-scrolling, like, rocks in the ground mm-hmm. kind of thing, the rock texture and everything. And the first image they posted didn't look bad, it definitely wasn't good because you could easily see the pattern. You could see, you know, mm-hmm. everything. And then they went through an iteration and everything. And then they came out with another version that was anti aliases all heck. There was probably 256 colors on that 256 <laughs> pixel image. And it looked like a blurry mess. And I said, it looks blurry. And man, they, they, they came on to me hard, you know, mm. You know, like, you know, read the rules, give proper feedback, tell a reason it's it's blurry. That's the reason. Yeah. It's a blurry mess. Mm-hmm. It's it's anti alias to an extreme to the where it's blurry. That yeah. is legitimate criticism. Exactly where it is at. Yeah. And do you and, think the consumer is going to say that they're going to say this looks horrible? You're a lousy artist. They're probably gonna just be like this. This game is crap. It's an asset flip. Don't buy it. Yeah, everything's but an like, asset flip. We went. Uh, there was a you know they were arguing with me, and I was like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it looks blurry because it's anti-aliased, mm-hmm. and 
you know, there is no, you know, cohesive, you know, it doesn't look like pixel art. It looks like a JPEG. Like, it looks like somebody took a pixel art image and then saved it as a JPEG and then saved that JPEG as another JPEG and then saved that JPEG as another JPEG and that JPEG as another JPEG. That's what it looked like. It looked like a very small JPEG image. And it did. As a matter of fact, a very small JPEG image might actually look better than that one did. And and I said that, you know, that it looked like a small JPEG image because it had been anti-aliased and blurred to, you know, 2,000 degrees. But they continued arguing. They would not accept that feedback. And they would just keep on, keep on, keep on. And mind you, that one of these people was a mod. Mm-hmm. Of this Discord channel, and you know, they kept on and kept on, and and was calling me a troll, <laughs> and everything else. It's like, look, I was like, look, you don't have to accept my feedback. That's perfectly fine. You can not accept my feedback if you don't want to accept it. But I'm I'm telling you what your issue is. Mm-hmm. You can do with it what you will. Yep. And and they kept on. <laughs> calling me a troll and everything else and you know and you know shoot me down and eventually you know somebody came in there and be like yeah he's right you know that is blurry that is very very blurry yeah you've got anti-aliasing everywhere there's no cohesive in the pixels Mm -hmm. and they're like oh okay yeah, that's like, the best the part when everyone just like immediately agrees with what somebody else says when you said the same thing and, and we're attacking me over it. Yeah. You know, and, and 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 it's not like they gave any more detail because they just said the same thing that I said, but in less words. Yeah. In less art, you know, less. They were they were so focused on arguing and not focused on taking any criticism, accepting criticism, and you have to accept criticism. Oh yes. Not all criticism is good. That one was, but you know, not all will be. Like I've had you know, criticism to do that I should put multiplayer in my game, and no, I shouldn't. You should turn into a visual novel. Yeah. yeah, and I think what you said a minute ago is very important. You can do whatever you want with the criticism, but you still have to take it, and don't argue about it. Yeah, and like we said, people don't care about your life when it comes to your art or your game. They care about what they see on the screen. You could spend 30, you know, the last five months of your life trying to make a, you know, draw a pixel art or make a, you know, a village in your game. And they'll look at it and they'll go, this looks like a damn Unity asset flip. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, Everything looks mismatched. It looks like some, you know, some first-rate art school student did this. And you have to take that. And if you don't take it and you don't improve, then you are going to be in for a very different world when you show your game beyond just, you know, your five or ten friends on a Facebook group or your Discord group or whatever, and they all hate it. And mm-hmm. they may tell to your face, they may tell to you on a Steam review, or they may not tell you anything. Because, again, people who leave reviews aren't the... They are the uh, loud minority. The yeah, they're, quiet, they're one out of 50, basically. Yeah. The quiet majority will just take one look at your game go, this looks horrible, go on to the next game. And you mm-hmm. will never know, unfortunately, how many people have been turned away by a decision that you made. Yeah. One other point in that ar- argument thing that went down was at one point, they're like, oh, well, we're purposely trying to make it that way. And I was like, you're uh... purposely trying to make it a blurry mess that nobody's going to like and everybody's going to complain about? Yeah, again, that goes back to all my the Mon Retro example I said earlier. Um, we're trying to make our game frustrating to play. You know, just like those games from 1990. Well, guess what? It's not 1990 anymore. 
Nope. You can invent time travel, make yeah. that game, and then take that game back to 1990, and then maybe you'll do good. Mm-hmm. But you may also fail, but it's still in the 90s. Yeah, pretty much. But oh. unless you have a time machine... Do not reference a game that was you know, that has anything to do with your game other than an inspiration you know that's older than than two years old because that was a completely different market yeah. completely totally different market and nothing they did with sales nothing anything they did has anything to do with your game the, mm -hmm. there is no correlation or there's there, there's no causation in that correlation. Because, I mean, FTL was a great game. And mm -hmm. how many thousands of people made FTL games, you know, FTL light games after that? Darkest and, Dungeon, and, Minecraft, Fortnite, you name it. And, and none of the games that it mimicked it, well, I wouldn't say none of the games, but a vast majority of the games that mimicked it, mimicked those games, failed horribly. I mean, there is some good ones out there, like uh, Creative versus a good uh, alternative to Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Or at least it was last time I played it. I don't know about now, because they're still updating and working on the game. I don't know what shape it is in now, but I know when I played it, like, four years ago or so, it was really good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I eventually got bored of it and stopped playing it. Yeah. But it was a free game, and then, you know, I was like, when they came out with supporter packs, I was like, yeah, I'm dropping my money on here. I don't care what they're offering. I just want to support them, you know, because it's a really good game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, like, here's the final point, then we're going to wrap things up, at least for me, is that there's a reason why Blizzard, for the longest time, were considered master game developers. Because they were able to look critically at other games and say, okay, we really like this, but we don't like this. And how do we, you know, how do we refine the wheel, essentially? It's not about making a new wheel. It's about taking what works and removing the stuff that doesn't. And it sounds very simple when I put it like that, but it is anything but. Because like we said, there are people who defend aspects of a game that don't work. Uh, there are people that defend anything. Yeah, oh there are yes. people that defend don't wear a mask in Corona and get sick. Yeah. Uh, like there's people who defend, you know, Hitler. There's mm -hmm. people who defend any number of things. Mm -hmm. The uh, carrion debate with people arguing about there should be a mini-map or some kind of map so people don't get lost. And, again... You have to be able to, if you want to grow, you have to be able to understand what works, just as you can have to understand what doesn't work. Not There is no such thing as a perfect game, and if you just blind... Well, there, there, there is a perfect game. Mm -hmm. And there's there's lots of perfect games. They're just not, not finished yet. Yeah. And they never will be. Because... They will be eternally in development. The developer will die, and nobody will ever see it. And again, there are games that exist that are the perfect game for you. But guess what? The perfect game for you is not the perfect game for me. It's not the perfect game for tens of thousands of people or millions of people on Steam. It's not even the perfect people for perfect game for everybody who likes that genre. Yeah. And if you don't understand why somebody doesn't like a game or don't understand why this criticism is coming in, you're never going to grow. Mm hmm And, you know, basically, think of think of feedback as playing a game. Like, mm -hmm. you're playing an RPG, and as you develop, as you learn stuff, as you program stuff, you get EXP. As you accept feedback and adjust your designs and everything, you get EXP. As you accept your know, feedback that isn't good and then you decide not to implement that, you get EXP. <laughs> and you're leveling yourself up and you're becoming a better game developer and 
of course we all gotta you know we all gotta shoot for the you know max level of nine 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 <laughs> or nine nine depending on where the level limit is yeah. point is is probably nobody's even made it to level 30 yet we're in like D and D levels, you know, kind of thing. Where where twenty is like you know max level kind of thing, but there's actually the the actual real max is like ninety nine, but nobody's past level twenty, <laughs> and you know most people are not even level two. Yeah. Don't be, don't be one of the level two noobs. Mm-hmm. Don't be a level two noob. <laughs> You've got to accept criticism. Grow as a developer. Get your EXP, level up, mm-hmm. upgrade your weapons, and and go out there and slay some monsters that are not basic slimes. Because you cannot make a living in an RPG by just slaying slimes. And by slimes, I mean you know that's basically the equivalent of you know your echo chamber, <laughs> whatever echo chamber that is. You know whether that's just your friends or anything. I'm not saying your friends are slimy. I'm saying they they have no experience in games, and they will give you no experience in games. Mm-hmm. All right, but I think with that, uh, let us wrap things up for today. I think this was a really solid topic. I think these mega topics are working really well for these discussions. Yeah, I like doing the mega topics. They're, they're really good. All right. So for everybody watching this uh, live or record, we're going to end things here. If you have suggestions for topics, let us know in the comments or join our respective discords. You'll find mine down below as well as Shark's Discord as well as his Twitter and YouTube. Or we'll post in chat right now in the next, like, 20 seconds. minute or two. <laughs> yeah. But we will be back next Sunday around 4, 4.30 EDT for our next stream and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we send the art and science of games. And I think with that, uh, do you have any updates uh, you want to tell people about Project Triad or are we good? Uh, well, Project Triad is in a precarious situation right now uh-huh. and uh, I'm not, not liking that. Uh, we're we're looking for a programmer, and uh, another programmer. This is like the programmer number, I think like eight, ten, mm-hmm. something like that, something crazy. And um, we desperately need a programmer who can do stuff properly and do it in a timely manner without costing us fifteen hundred dollars a month. Because <laughs> well, I don't have. Fifteen hundred dollars a month. I I I, I have like fifteen hundred dollars. Period. Mm, well, definitely best of luck with that. If anyone's interested, get in touch with Shark and join his Discord down below. Yeah, indeed. But could very much use the help. Mm-hmm. But with that said, thank you for tuning into this week's cast. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we some the art and science of games. Until next time, take care.